This video and the next video are meant to refresh your knowledge of the phase diagrams and their application to petrology. This first video will focus on the phase rule, two component or binary phase diagrams, and material covered in chapter six of your textbook. The next video will focus on ternary phase diagrams and their application specifically to igneous systems. Remember last semester, we focused our attention on simple closed systems or what is available in the system at the beginning is what's available at the end. Now we will take this a step further and see what happens when the complexity of an open system is added where, there, where what is available at the beginning will be different than what's available at the end. For now though, we'll assume that our system is any igneous environment. If we remember the Gibbs phase rule defines the degrees of freedom or how much a system can change for a given set of conditions. This equation defines the number of components, or in our case, the number of chemical constituents, in relationship to the number of intensive parameters and number of mechanically separable constituents or phases. To properly use this equation, we need to understand how our system is behaving, meaning, how, meaning is it closed, isolated, or open? If the system is closed or isolated, we can define the state of the system in simplistic terms of variables which we are familiar with, pressure, temperature, density, and composition. Once we know a critical number of these variables, other variables become fixed as a result of them becoming dependent upon one another. In a closed or isolated system, we have to ask how many variables must we know before the others become, can be determined. This is what the phase rule was developed to address. Opening the system, to chemical exchange creates complexities that makes the equation difficult to use. Therefore, in open system, phase diagrams are consistently being updated with each new set of conditions, or they become too complex to be reliably used. Let's go through our equation variables in order to understand how to properly use the equation for igneous and metamorphic systems. Our phase, or phi, is defined by a type of physically distinct materials in a system that is mechanically separable from the rest. A phase beam may be a mineral, a liquid such as melt or water, a gas such as a volatile, or an amorphous solid such as a glass. A phase can be complex chemically, such as maybe like a tequila sunrise, but as long as you have, cannot separate it further by mechanical means, it's a single phase. A component is our chemical constituent, such as silica, water, O2, SiO2, or pelagiclase. We can define individual components however we would like, but for the purpose of the phase rule treatment, we will define the number of components as the minimum number of mechanically separable chemical species required to completely define the system and all of its phases. The proper choice of the number of components for the application of the phase rule is not always easy. The choice commonly depends on the behavior of the system and a range of conditions over which the system is being studied. Finally, we need to understand why we use intensive parameters versus extensive parameters. Extensive parameters are dependent upon the quantity of the material in the system. Therefore, they are often little concern to us since water is water regardless of how much is present. These variables do become more important to us when the system is open and therefore will return to this idea. Intensive parameters are independent of size and are the properties of the substance in the system. There are a large number of intensive parameters and we've seen that they are independent. If we return to our question of how many of these variables we must specify before others are determined before we can fully constrain the system. If we define our degrees of freedom as the minimum number of intensive variables that need to be specified to completely define the system while at chemical equilibrium, we can hence use the equation of F equals C minus phi plus two. We make that simple enough to tell us that for each component we add to the system, we must specify one inten additional intensive parameter in order to fully understand the system. This is why the systems must be in chemical equilibrium and therefore not open systems. And if we have an open system, they're typically not applicable and this equation is useless.
The simplest version of a phase diagram that we can apply the phase rule is a one component phase diagram. The problem with one component diagrams is that it's not useful at high temperature systems. So therefore, we'll start with our binary diagrams. When we add the second component, a number of different and interesting options become available, and four options are common in geologic systems. But we still have to remember that, that these are very simplistic, and defining the system is critical. Variance in the system can be as high as three with one phase systems, but are often complex and difficult to interpret and visualize. Therefore, we restrict a variable. Commonly for geology, we we'll restrict pressure. The most useful type of binary diagram are complete solid solution series diagrams. These diagrams illustrate components that complexity completely mix. An example is the plagioclase system where albite, the sodium rich end member, and anorthite, the calcium rich end member, are mixed. Be careful about confusing components and phases. Remember that C is the number of chemical constituents, in this case, albite and anorthite. The phases here are the liquid and the solid. At each end of the horizontal axis, we have a one component system representing the pure end member of the solid solution series, albite on the left and anorthite on the right. Each of these pure systems behaves like a typical isobaric one component system in that the solids melt at a single fixed temperature at which solid and liquid coexist in equilibrium, just as our water and ice example from last semester. Applying the isobaric phase rule with C minus one or equaling one and phi equaling two yields the equation F minus one minus two plus one equaling zero. If we look at the single single end member, albite melts at 1118 degrees centigrade and anorthite melts at 1553 degrees centigrade. Now we proceed to the effects of an added component on either pure system. First, the addition of albite component into the pure anorthite system lowers the melting point. Adding anorthite to a pure albite system raises the melting point, but this is not the only effect. Crystallization of multi-component melts becomes much more interesting than the pure one component melts. Let's examine this a little further. To understand this, let's use the phase rule to analyze the behavior of a melt and intermediate composition. Consider cooling a bulk melt composition of composition A at 1560 degrees centigrade, which is 60% anorthite and 100% liquid. In this case, the composition is equal to the bulk composition because the system is entirely liquid. Now, if we cool the system to 1475 degrees centigrade, point B, what happens? When we get to point B, plagioclase solid begins to crystallize, adding a phase to the system. However, the plagioclase that first forms has a composition at point C, or a composition of anorthite 87, a different composition to that of the melt. How does the phase rule help us understand what's going on at this point? Because C equals two and phi equals two, our degrees of freedom equals one. Now we must specify only one intensive variable to completely determine the system. Whereas the one component system had a single curve separating the liquid from the solid fields, we now have two curves that specify a relationship between the composition of both the liquid and the solid with respect to the temperature. The upper curve is called the liquidus. It specifies the composition at any, of any liquid as it coexists at, with a solid at a particular temperature. The lower curve is the solidus, which specifies the composition of any solid that coexists with a liquid at a particular temperature. What the phase rule then says for the situation is, for a two component, two phase system at a fixed pressure, the composition of both phases, in this case, the liquid and the solid, depend only upon temperature. As we continue to cool our original bulk mixture of 60% anorthite below 1475 degrees C, or point B, the composition of both phases 
liquid and solid vary. The liquid composition changes along the liquidus from B to G, whereas the plagioclase changes from point C to point H. Equilibrium melting is simply the opposite process. The divariant one phase solid system of composition I in the phase diagram heats up until it melting begins. The partially melted system is univariant and the first liquid to form has a composition of G. The first liquid to form is not the same as the solid that melts. As heating continues, the composition of the solid and liquid is constrained to follow the solidus and liquidus lines, respectively, via a continuous reaction. Whether the process is crystallization or melting, solid is always richer in anorthite components, calcium and aluminum, than the coexisting liquid. Calcium is thus more refractory than sodium, meaning that it concentrates in the residual solid during melting. If we open the system up and allow the chemical components to be removed or added, we lose chemical equilibrium. In the previous case, the plagioclase or melt that is produced remains in the system. If we open the system, these products are removed, changing the bulk composition. We'll revisit this concept over the next few lectures and spend quite a bit of time on it over the next few weeks. Adding a second component certainly has a profound effect on a one component system, but the effects are not always limited to solid solution behavior. In a great number of binary systems, the additional component does not enter into a solid solution series, but changes the melting relationships nonetheless. As an example of a binary system with no solid solution, we want to talk about a system that with considerable natural, natural equability, the diopside plus anorthite system. The system diopside anorthite is interesting in that it provides a simple analog for basalt, clinopyroxene, and, bas and plagioclase. In this type of system, there is a low point on the liquidus, point D, called the eutectic point. Such systems are thus called binary eutectic systems. Because there is no solid solution, there is no solidus, although some petrologists refer to the line GH as a type of solidus. With these types of systems, it is essential to remember that all solid phases will be 100% of the end member, and all liquids will go to the eutectic point before becoming 100% solid. As with the solid solution series, equilibrium melting will behave in an opposite manner to equilibrium crystallization. The first melt will always be the eutectic composition. Moving away from the point re requires consumption of a solid phase. Which solid is consumed depends on the bulk composition. If we open the system and remove the crystals from the system during crystallization, or what we'll learn as fractional crystallization in the coming weeks, the path followed by the liquid does not change and the final composition of the liquid and, and solid is unaffected. Only the final bulk composition is changed. If the fractional crystallization is effective, the final bulk composition will be the eutectic composition. Partial melting is different, and the composition of the liquid is drastically affected. As we will learn, partial melting does or should not occur in nature. A critical point of melt is required for melt segregation before it can be physically separated from the solid. This concept is discussed in detail in the coming lectures. We can add complexity to the binary system with the addition of the peritectic point between two immiscible solids. This behavior is exactly the same as the eutectic system. The only difference is that the solid phase will react with the liquid to form an intermediate composition phase. Only once the solid phase is consumed will the system move to a eutectic point. In some cases, the peritectic will be the final liquid composition if the system is depleted in one end member. Remember, we talked about this quite a bit last semester. And if you need more assistance on this, you can see the two help videos that are posted on Blackboard. We will discuss this more in the next video and when we talk about ternary phase diagrams as it's easier to understand with a ternary system.